pray. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for your anointing and your spirit. And Lord, I just pray that right now, Lord, you would begin to open up our hearts and our minds. And thank you, Lord, for working in our midst and proving that you exist, Father, through your power and manifestation. And Father, we pray that right now, Lord, that you would save people in service, Lord, that you would restore people in the service, that you would continually, Lord, reveal your mighty work. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. amen. All right. We're seated, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. And it is a good one, isn't it? Yes. All right. Open up your Bibles, if you would, over to Joel chapter 2, verse 25, please. Joel 2, 25. And today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I believe will help turn things around in your life. All of us have times when we need things turned around. Amen? And, uh, and one of the things that holds us back is our past. Many times we make mistakes. Many times mistakes are made by other people that hold us back. And we think because of what they've done or what we've done that we can only do so much in our lives. But remember this. The future is determined not by the past but by the present. Amen? In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It didn't say now faith was. It didn't say now faith will be. It says that now faith is. So what we do in faith right now is going to determine our future. Amen? And so don't allow the past or the future, the fear that, you know, the fear of people, they go, well, I'm not going to do anything until... I see things change around me. And uh, so they never do anything. But God wants you to do something in your life right now, today, to be blessed. Amen? Amen. His word. So look with me in Joel chapter 2. And uh, here is a promise that was given to the church, or to believers, should I say, uh, that are, is very specific and pointed and really shows all of this. In fact, put it on the screen there for me, Joel 2.25. Do you have it up there? There we go. All right. Now look what it says. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten and the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army, which I have sent among you. Now, go to the next verse. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of our Lord your God who has dealt wonderfully with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Now, this is a promise that was given specifically to Israel, but it also includes us because we are of the seed of Abraham. Amen? Amen. And in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, you have the major prophets and you have the minor prophets. The major prophets had a prophetic word that was global. It was for the whole world. The minor prophets was a prophecy and promises that were given to those who believed at that time and also for us today. Amen? And so when you look at Joel, you need to also look at the book of Malachi and the other books because they all intertwine together. In other words... This, this group of believers was suffering financially because they had not brought in all of their tithes and offerings. And in Malachi, he addresses that. And now God is telling them through all these prophets, do my word and I will restore the years that these locust plagues have devastated your financial well-being in your, in, in your midst. Amen. So that's what this specific... Uh, prophecy is for even though we know in the word they could be applied to every area in your life whether it's a restoration of your family whether it's a restoration of your health whatever and we'll see other scriptures that will clarify that amen but notice again in Joel 2.25 put it up there again now notice it describes Four different kinds of locusts. Swarming locusts, crawling locusts, swimming locusts, and chewing locusts. 
very significant. Now, these locuses is talking about different kinds of locusts or the development of a locust. Amen? And here's how it works. When a locust plague would come into an area, the chewing locusts would start first. And they would eat the very top part of the wheat crop. Amen? And then the next kind of locust that came in would eat the stalks of the, of the, of the plant. And then the other type of locust would eat the stump of the stalk. And then the fourth type of locust would eat the roots of the stalk. Completely destroy it. But notice, it puts the chewing locust, which is the first one that does the least amount of damage, he puts that last on the list. Now, in chapter 1, he lists this same locust group, but he puts the chewy locust first because that's where it starts. And then it goes from bad to worse to terrible to horrible. Amen? So, here, when he says that God will restore the years that these bugs have destroyed your financial future, he ends it with the ones that created the least amount of damage. It's almost like he's saying, all right, I want you to get this. God's not only going to restore the big part, but all the little stuff as well in your life. Yeah, come on now. Amen? Yeah, and, and watch this. I want you to see this truth here because it's important. It'd be like you lose your house and you pray, Lord, I need my house restored and someone gives you a brand new house and you moved into the house, but it doesn't have curtains. It doesn't have the nursery walls are not painted. The little, the little stuff that a woman will do in the house to make it just right is not there. You got the house and you believe you've been restored, but God says, no, when I restore you, I'm not only going to give you the house, I'm going to put up the drapery. I'm going to fix up the nursery. I'm going to put the flower pots in the house. I'm going to do all the, all the wallpaper for you, and you're going to come in, and it's completely fixed. Amen. Hallelujah. So, so watch this. See, so, I, so I've lost a lot, and I'm hurt because of it. Now I can get the money back or I can get the relationship back, but I still have this pain inside. And God says, I'll restore that. I'll make your heart soft again. I'm going to restore completely in your life everything that you lost. That's the promise. It's the promise. So, Maybe you've been through a divorce and you're scarred inside and your children are at odds with, you know, with going to one side of the family, the other side of the family, and there's friction and all this. And, and you say, Lord, it wasn't my fault. Now watch this. Even if it was your fault, the promise is for us. Whether it was your fault or not your fault. And see, that this is something that is so awesome. Because Paul stated in Romans 8, he said, All things work together for the good for those that love God and of those that are called according to his purpose. So all I got to do is this. All I got to do is love God. And Jesus said, If you love me, do my commandments and follow his will. And then everything that is thrown at me, whether good or bad, God will work it together for my good in my life. So if I've been disobedient in the past and I got this mess I'm experiencing, all I got to do is start loving God, start doing what he says, and God will restore that. Even, be, even when it was created by me and my mistakes. Amen. Isn't that good news? So, so here's what I want you to do. If your marriage has been destroyed, just love your husband the way Christ loved the church. Or, or no, let me put it this way. Go to the Word and say, Lord, 
how can I display love in my family now? How can I do it? And the Bible says to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And for wives, to be submissive to your husband as unto the Lord. And it also says to dwell with your wife in an understanding way. So do everything that you learn in the word in that marriage and believe that God will restore it and he'll restore it. Amen? Or if it's financial problems and you haven't been tithing, start tithing, start giving, and God will restore it. Amen. Amen. So, and if it's a physical problem, then all right, all right, Lord, I'm going to do what your word says about physical things. And I'm going to believe I receive right now, Lord. And I'm going to stand in faith for that. And Lord, I'm going to make sure that I stay in fellowship with you when I'm with other people. And I'm going to make sure that I don't allow the ought of other people to come into my life and stop my prayer life. I'm going to love And then you can rest assured that God will restore everything in your life. Everything. Restore it. Hallelujah. 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 See, sometimes what looks like a setback is actually a setup for success. (laughs) Amen. Amen. You take the story of Joseph. Here's a guy that had a vision of God. He would be a leader or whatever. His brothers got jealous of him. And remember, they sold him into slavery. And that's the emotion, isn't it? It looked like he's going down, but he's going up. And so he's sold into slavery. Comes a slave in Potiphar's house. And he's promoted. But then Potiphar's wife gets the hots for him. And he resists it because why? He's loving God. Amen. And the wife accuses him before uh, her husband and they throw him into the prince king's prison. Again, it's a demotion. But he keeps loving God and he's promoted. And then the, uh, the one that tasted the king's food was thrown into, into the prison. And the one that was the butler of the king or the pharaoh was thrown into the prison. And there with Joseph. And uh, they said, Joseph, we've both had dreams. Could you interpret the dreams? And he says, well, I'll do this for you. But if you get released, I want you to put in a word to the Pharaoh. Tell him that I've been mistreated and let me get out of this jail. So he interprets the dream of the uh, guy that tested the king's food. and, And the dream turned out that he was going to be killed. And then the butler, though, the dream was he was going to be reinstated. So the butler gets out of jail, goes back to the Pharaoh, and forgets about Joseph. It looks like a setback, doesn't it? Amen. I mean, you know, he should have said something. But see, we don't understand everything. At this time, the Pharaoh had not had any dreams that were troubling him. It was two years later when the Pharaoh started to have dreams that troubled him. And then he said, I need an interpreter. And then the butler goes, oh, I know someone, Joseph. And then Joseph comes in, interprets it. The Pharaoh's so pleased, he makes him the second most powerful person in the kingdom. But if he would have been released two years earlier... He would have missed the opportunity. So it looked like a setback, but it was a setup by God. He was setting us up for victory. So you got sick, but it's a setup. You come on, you got broke, but it was a setup. You had a bad marriage. But it was a setup. Your children were rebellious, but it was a setup. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to, I'm turning from that to you, Lord. And when you do, then God empowers you to do His word, to get saved, to believe, to whatever. But see, He never intended us to do anything by ourselves. Amen. 
Nothing. See, he, remember in, in Hebrews 13, it says this. It says that God will never leave us or forsake us. Remember that verse? But in the next verse, it says that he is our helper. Amen. Why doesn't he want to leave us? Because he wants to help you with everything in your life. Amen. So, whatever you're going through, God is there to help you. If you got to forgive, God is there to help you forgive. If you gotta, if you got to turn from some immoral behavior, God is there to help you do that. If you got to keep your tongue in line with the word, God is there to help you to do it. See, in, 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 in James, it says this. It says that, chapter 3, it says, no man can tame the tongue. But yet in chapter 1, James says, anyone who doesn't bridle his tongue, his religion is useless. So, if no one can tame the tongue, and my religion is useless without taming the tongue, then what do I do? You get God to help you. Say, Lord, put a guard on my mouth. When I start to say something wrong, check me. Show me what to say. And then whenever God gives you a message, it's with power. Whenever God leads, it's with power. Whenever God suggests, it's with power. So I can live a Christian life. I'm certainly not perfect. But if I turn to him every time I'm in trouble... He will empower me. And it's not being saved by works. It's being saved by faith in what I believe. And what I believe is empowering me to do his will. Are are you getting in this? So, in this message today, my desire is that all of us would believe God, do his word, oh man, with his power. Lord, I need help to show up at church tonight. Amen. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me. I don't want to be distracted. Lord, help me, Lord. Help me, help me. Or, Lord, I need to pray this morning. Lord, help me pray. See, the Lord is always leading. He's always guiding. But we got to listen to our hearts. And we got to respond to him. And then he'll empower you. Now, turn with me over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. And uh, put it up the screen if you would. Luke chapter 9. And let me uh, begin to close with this. Luke chapter, did I say 9? Luke chapter 6, verse 62. Luke 6, 62, please. No, that's not right. That's Luke 1, 62, please. 62, please. 6 2. It's Luke chapter 6, verse 62. All right. Uh, it's not Luke. It's not, it's chapter 9. Sorry! I was wrong, you were right. <laughs> Look at this. But Jesus said unto him, no one having put his hand in the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Say fit. That means that you will not be spiritually able to do what God has called you to do if you're not fit spiritually. He says if you look, you got to keep looking at the word and not turn back. And in the words, keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't turn back. Keep looking to his word. Don't be distracted. Don't look at this. Don't look at that. Keep your eyes on the word. It'll empower you. Because when you really repent, you turn and you look. God help me and God helps you. 
with a new light. You know, years ago when I was a young boy, I used to love uh, trying to catch frogs down at the local pond. And the frogs, you could never catch them when they were by the pond. They'd always jump in the water before you could ever get to them. But if you saw a frog out in the grass somewhere, you catch them because they can't hop as fast as you can run, right? And, uh, but you know why you can't catch a frog when he's next to a pond? Because of the way that he sees. Frogs, in their vision, it's like a blackboard. And because their vision is like a blackboard, they only see the threats and the things they want to eat. Everything else is blacked out. So when you're down there, they see you automatically, and they're, they're not distracted by anything else. They see the threats and their food. So they, they can always get away because there's no distractions. But with us, I, I almost wish that we had frog eyes <laughs> so that we could look at the Lord and not look at the storm. Look at the word and not look at the world. But the reality is sometimes we're looking at the world and it distracts us from the word. And then our faith, then we become unfit spiritually. You got to keep your mind on the Lord. On his word and say, Lord, I need your help. I need your power and not be distracted from this or that. How many times have you, have you said, Lord... I, you know, I, I knew I should have prayed, but I was distracted by this or that. And you missed out on something that God wanted you to get a breakthrough in. Because you were distracted. So, here's the summary of this message. God will restore everything. Everything. Even the smallest thing in your life... If you love God, if you do the word that you know, then God takes everything that's done to you, whether good or bad, and turns it, and it becomes a stepping stone for your success. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, I got to stay in fellowship with God. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Because when I'm in fellowship with God, I'm doing his commandments and doing those things that are pleasing in sight. But pastor, there are things in my life that I forget to do that I know I need to do. That's okay. The Bible says that the blood will cover those sins that are sins of ignorance or sins that you forgot about. But what you remember at that moment, what you should do, if you do the word, God then will be in fellowship with you. And then, keep your eyes on the promise, on the victory, on the healing. See the healing. See the promise. See the financial breakthrough. See that and don't be distracted by the storm. And you'll stay fit. And God will move. Seek God to sign this thing to work with imperfect people. All we got to do is do what we know to do at that moment. That's it. You may be imperfect, but I'm doing everything that I know to do right now in my life. I'm doing that. Then you can say, Lord, my latter days will be better than my former and you can rejoice. Hallelujah. On behalf of Jack and Joyce, we want to say thank you for supporting our ministry. When in the Seattle area, we invite you to join us for services at the River, Sundays at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 6 p.m., and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Thanks again for watching, and join us next week at the River.